Now, here's the next one. Respond. The ability to let life touch you. Don't let it kill you, but let it touch you. Here's what's important. Let sad things make you sad. Because we need to understand the depths of sadness so we can understand the incredible ecstasy of joy. You can't know the highs without the lows. You can't dismiss all the things that need to burden your heart and your soul. The drama of Jesus' life, there were two words that were so important. Here they are. It said he was touched and it said he was moved. I'm asking you to jot down those words. You've got to learn to be touched and to be moved. Part of it is to be moved out of complacency, to be moved out of just drifting. But it's also to be moved by the story, to be moved by what happened, and to be touched by someone's dilemma, and to be touched by someone's problem. Respond. I've learned how to do that. I'm the best guy in the world to take to the movies. I really get into it. I want to be taken on a journey. Make me laugh, make me cry. Take me high, take me low. Shake me over hell, but don't leave me unmoved. I finally saw Dr. Zhivago for the third time in Melbourne, Australia. Come see Dr. Zhivago. I went and saw it for the third time. I'd always missed the significant ending of the movie until this time. Finally, I got it. Comrade General said, Tanya, how did you come to be lost? And she said, I was just lost. He said, no, how did you come to be lost? And she said, well, the city was on fire. The war had come. And my father and I were running through the city, and he let go of my hand, and I was lost. And Comrade General said, no, Tanya, Kamarowski was not your father. Do you think your father would have let go of your hand? This man, Dr. Zhivago, the poet, I'm telling you, he was your father. I've been searching for you, and I found you. This was your father. I finally got the message. The other times I'm eating popcorn, waiting for the movie to finish. I mean, you know, this, this, this time I got it. I got it. He was not your If my father would have been with me, would he have let go of my hand? No. Would he have died first? So you've got to let the drama, you've got to let the emotional drama affect you. Because here's what it does. It fills up your emotional bank so that when you get ready to talk, we're going to discuss later on today, you draw not only from language but from emotion. And the mixture of both language and emotion is some of the most powerful force in the world. So let yourself be affected. Let yourself be touched. Let the positive make you positive. Let the sad make you sad. Let the joyful make you joyful. Let the songs ring in your head. But also let the minor key, let the sadness affect you so that you'll be a well-rounded person when you deal with the marketplace, your children and everyone else. Key. Now, here's the other three. First, learn to absorb everything around you. Take it all in. Don't miss anything. Next, respond. Let life touch you. Here's number three. We just briefly touched on it. Reflect. Reflect means to go back over and experience. If you've been through something, when it's over, just sit down and think about it again. You say, well, some things are tough to relive. I know, but if you'll go through a bit of the emotional drama, again, it'll drive that experience so deep in your consciousness, it'll never go away. Now, this is not to drag you back into the past. This is not to drag you down into the sadness that, that if that all was all there was to life, it would overwhelm us all. It's not to do that, but it's to make you a richer person in terms of the full spectrum of emotional content. It's to make you a whole person to better understand someone else's dilemma if you let the dilemma of certain things affect you as much as it can. Reflect back and let the thought of it, you know, put your head between your legs as you ponder, wow. Here's some good times to reflect. One, at the end of the day. Take a few minutes at the end of the day. So you lock that day into your consciousness to serve you well the rest of your life. 
Here's a good phrase. Each day is a piece of the mosaic of our life. When you get ready to talk about your past, you don't want any of these pieces to be missing, if you can help it. Bill Bailey was entertaining us with some stories last night. He knows the names. He knows the date. He said it was raining. It was a cloudy morning. I could see the storm coming from the east. See, that's so powerful. How old? How young? Who? What were they wearing? Who else would remember? Special people remember the drama. They reflect until it becomes part of them. You read a book and then you reflect on the book. Bill Bailey's unique because he can read a 300-page book in about 45 minutes. And then he can tell you about this book and make it more fantastic than if you read it yourself. So he, I just follow him around and don't have to read so much. Incredible. Reflect. At the end of the week, jot down, take a few hours. Hey, a week is such a piece of your life. You traded labor for a paycheck. You traded a piece of your life for getting paid and compensated. And all of the other drama of the things that happen to you, social, personal, spiritual, physical. A week is worth pondering. Take an hour. Go back over your notes and go back over your day timer and go back over everything and say, where have I been and what did I do and who did I see and what did they say and what did it, how did it feel? At the end of the month, take half a day at the end of the month. At the end of the week, a, a year, take a, a weekend. Time to reflect. Maybe this is what was meant when the advice was given. Here it is in Scripture. Every once in a while, you should go into your closet. It's an interesting word, closet. I don't know if it's a closet like we have today, but what I think it means is a place away. Go into your closet away. And then it said something interesting. When you get in there, shut the door. Shut the door. Not necessarily a physical door to shut yourself in, but to shut everything out. To shut everything out for a while. And just in there, in that place of solitude. For all of my public life, traveling all around the world, you know, from hotels and limousines and all the rest of the busy life I live, guess what I seek? Solitude. The time alone, part of it up at the farm for me, making wine and growing crops is part of it. But some of that's sort of just like a diversion, doing something else versus, you know, traveling and lecturing. But sometimes I have to get alone. All alone on the side of the river, bank of the river. I've got a dirt bike. I ride the Jeep trails up at Clear Lake in California where there's no stop signs, where life is... Simple and easy. Listen to the birds and watch the chipmunks. Away, away. And when you get into your closet, it says, shut the door. And there you think about your life and think about your marriage and think about your friends. Think about the past and think about the future. What could you do now once you come out of the closet? A place away. Solitude. Jot this down. Some answers you must come up with all by yourself. And some solutions you must come up with alone. Some decisions. You know, your wife can help and your husband can help and the family can help. And people around you can help and friends can help and you can get input from everywhere. And finally, finally, when it comes down to the final decision, some of that you have to do all alone. They say the presidency of the United States is a lonely job. The general of the army, many times that's a lonely job. Sending people into battle knowing some are going to lose their lives. That's a lonely job, making those lonely decisions that's going to affect so many. But whether it affects your life personally or someone else, you've got to take some of this time and get used to the time to be alone to make those decisions and think things over. Okay. Reflecting. Here's what it does. Helps you to gather up the past and invest it in the future. So you've got to make that note because only humans can perform this miracle, taking the past and investing it in the future. Dogs can't do it, and animals can't do it. Fish can't do it. Snakes can't do it. Only humans can do it. Here's what you can do. Greatly alter the future by investing the past into the future. Past errors in judgment that you've now corrected. Past errors in thought that you've now corrected. Past loss of time that you now know better how to utilize. 
Now you begin to invest all this into the future. You can't believe the productivity scale. You can't believe the learning scale. You can't believe what will start coming out now into the future. Your promise will be brighter than you ever thought possible. Learning to gather up the past and invest it in the future. When my father was about to turn 76, I said, Dear Father, can you imagine what it's going to be like to gather up the last 75 years and invest them in your 76th? Wasn't that a good idea? That's better than saying, I think I can hang on one more year. I mean, come on. Gathering up the past and investing it in the future. Jot this down. The past is currency. We sometimes use this expression. This person has a wealth of experience. Is experience wealth? And the answer is yes, it's wealth. The past becomes currency, coin, commodity, available now from lessons learned, from emotions gathered, from things not missed, from colors and sights and sounds and highs and lows, and progress and deceleration. All of that combined now put into the next few weeks, the next few months, the next year. You can imagine the accelerated progress that comes from learning to do this exercise. It's very important. Now here's number four. We absorb, we respond, we reflect. Number four, now we must act. We must now put all of the learning and the emotional content into activity. Why? Without that, reality eludes us. It cannot be created. You can't create a career unless you do these four steps. Absorb what you can, learn all you can, respond to it and let it affect you. Let the emotional part of it drive you. Set your goals, let it touch you, reflect until it becomes real, possible, then act on it and do it. Activity is the vessel in which we pour the drama of our life so that it performs the miracle of creating reality. For you now to act on what you've heard, felt, thought, seen, the people you've met and all of it, now put it into action. Put it into a health plan that won't quit. Put it into a health plan that will give you a unique physical support system. Put it into a career plan. Put it into a relationship plan. Act upon it and you can create a masterpiece. Michelangelo was a genius, but it was not his genius that created the masterpiece. But his genius was so strong and his belief in it was so powerful that he picked up the chisel and the hammer. So I want you to just make that an analogy now in your notes. You must now finally pick up the chisel and the hammer. After you've taken the classes and after you've absorbed and after you've thought and after you've wondered and after you've set goals and after you've come to a conclusion about your promise and your future, Now you must pick up the chisel and the hammer. And it's the chisel and the hammer and the sweat and the muscle. And the chisel and the hammer and the sweat and the muscle that builds a career. Otherwise, the rest of all of this serves no purpose. Why absorb and why respond and why reflect and why gather up the promise of the future? There is no purpose unless now you act. But if you act, a masterpiece of a career is waiting for you. A masterpiece of a good marriage is waiting for you. A masterpiece of a fortune is waiting for you. What you're going to do with it and who you're going to, where you're going to give it away, benevolence and all the rest. Now here's the last part. The ability to share. We absorb, we respond, we reflect... We take disciplined action, start creating reality. Now the key to make life really unique and worthwhile is to share. Sharing has a certain unique magic of its own. Here's what I learned in sharing ideas. If you share an idea with ten different people, they get to hear it once, you get to hear it ten times. So here's part of self-interest for yourself getting you even better prepared for the future. Share ideas. Share with your family. Share with the people around you. 
Share with other employees. Share with your colleagues. Because by sharing, two things happen. Here's what we call it. I don't know how to explain it, but I do know it happens. And I don't know all about how it happens or why it happens. It just happens. When one person shares with another, two things happen. The audience could be transformed, and so could the speaker. If you share with someone else, they could be transformed. You may have dropped in at the right time. This may be their moment. They've got three numbers dialed into the lock already. And if you say it well and say it right, you'll be the fourth number that they can dial into the lock of their personal experience and the door will come open and there's opportunity they never saw before. The person who hears can be transformed. But here's what else is exciting. The person who speaks can be transformed. Guess what we're all looking for? Transformation for our new life, the new life tomorrow, the new life this month, the new life next year, the new life this year. The caterpillar one day says, I think I was made for more than this, crawling on the ground. So the butterfly climbs the tree, attaches himself to a leaf, and spins the cocoon. Who knows what disciplined effort it takes to spin a cocoon? But something inside the caterpillar says, I was designed for something more than being just a caterpillar. And then when the cocoon is ready and it opens up, out comes a butterfly that flies away. Maybe singing, I think I can fly. I think I can touch the sky. I used to be a caterpillar on the ground. Now I fly. I'm asking you to go through such a metamorphosis. I'm asking you often to go through a period where you say, new skills, new things are waiting for me. And part of this will come if you'll translate for other people what you feel in your heart and in your soul. As awkward as your language might be at first, don't hesitate to do it. Here's what sharing does, makes room for more. If this glass is full of water, wow, here's my coffee. I won't take as much time as Ziegler did. Key question, if this glass is full of water, can it hold anymore? If the glass is full of water, can it hold anymore? And the answer is yes. Yes, if you pour some out. So jot that down. If you want more, you've got to pour out what you got. Then you have the opportunity to receive more. Now, unlike the glass that remains the same size when you pour some out, not so consciousness in human beings. Your capacity will increase the more you share. You'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, why the self-interest wish to be bigger? Here's why, to hold more of the next experience. Some people can't hold much happiness because they're too small. Their thinking is too small. Their activity is too small. They're too small in their ability to share. They're just too small. Can't hold much. They're too small. But the bigger you get, the more you will receive. When happiness is poured out, you'll get more. When joy is poured out on the nation, you'll get more. When bounty is poured out from the economy, you will get more. If you share what you've got and become bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, some people are not only small, they have their glass turned upside down. Hard to get anything in. But here's what you've done in coming here this weekend. You've come with an open mind, an open consciousness, ready to receive. And I promise you, we're going to pour everything we possibly can into every ounce of time we've got here to make it beneficial for you, give you not just your money's worth, but your time's worth. Now, one last part under personal development. Personal development leads to all good things because it makes you unique. Here's what my mentor said when I first met him. I'm 25 years old. I'm broke. Not destitute, but broke. Here's what he said to me. Mr. Owen, now's the time to set a goal to become a millionaire, which back there was a pretty good leap. Age 25, that was a long time ago. He said, set a goal to become a millionaire. And he said, here's why. And I want you to jot it down. For what it will make of you to achieve it. The purpose for setting goals is self-development. The 
purpose for setting goals is to become the person that can achieve them. So the whole real major subject here this whole weekend is personal development, seeing what all we can become. Now jot this phrase down, don't settle for less than you can be. I asked Mr. Schofield, if I get to making money, how much should I earn? He said, all you possibly can. How many books should I read? As many as you possibly can. How far should I go? As far as you possibly can. How much should I share? As much as you possibly can. In the course of my lifetime, how much should I do? You should do all you possibly can. Go as far as you can. Reach as high as you can. Touch everybody you possibly can. I made that commitment a long time ago. And it has served me so well. And it brought me to Dallas this weekend. There's no other place I would rather be. I committed to being here. I'm glad I came. Let's take 20 minutes, everybody, for a break and then come back. <laughs>